so happy that you took time to join me today in my sewing room. The visit from a friend is a cherished moment. I love every moment that I have when I can share my love of sewing with you. Sewing is my love and I know it is yours as well. If you are beginning your sewing journey, take your time and cherish every stitch. Our pleasure comes from putting our personal touch on everything we do. Let's get started and enjoy our sewing experiences today. This is one of the most exciting shows showing you a lot about how to use a serger. One of the techniques that I love is this elastic band inserted with a serger. It is the casing it is absolutely fabulous. And when you put on the skirt or the pants using that technique, it means your elastic does not roll over. I'm sure some of you have probably experienced that. Now look here, we're gonna have so much fun with the waves, the pink and black waves. This happens to be done on a serger. And the same pink and black waves go around the bottom of the skirt. The beautiful thing about this skirt, every bit of it has been constructed on a serger. Now let's just see a few pieces here and kind of get some few techniques in mind. This is a curved portion that has been attached with the serger. There's a little trick for that. You see how beautifully it is attached absolutely in a serger curve and all of this is done on a serger. Don't you just love those little waves? This elastic trick is really special. For the casing for the waistband, you cut your elastic the length you want it, stretch your fabric out one little piece at a time and serge the top. You can see it's already done here. The elastic has been attached with a serger. Now this is the real trick right here. All right, here is the elastic that has been attached with the serger on the top of the skirt. Now you fold it down one time, fold it over, and you do just a little bit at a time and then fold it back again, much like you used to do a blind hem, except you don't want any fabric exposed. You just fold it to the very edge and then use a serger one more time and you have a perfect casing done by serger. I am so happy to have as my guest today, Margaret Tully. Margaret is an educational consultant for Baby Lock. Margaret, thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Now I'm I having cannot, a good time. Oh, we have fun. Yes. I can't wait to see what you're gonna share with us about those wonderful serger tricks. Well, we're gonna talk about curved edges. With this skirt, we have an outside curve and an inside curve. Typically that would be challenging, but a serger will serge any shape cut edge as long as it thinks it's straight. That's all <laughs> we have to do is convince the serger that all of these edges are straight. So we'll put all of these fabrics right sides together. As long as it thinks it's straight. Thinks it's okay, straight. Now we're gonna That's make it think right. it's straight. That's okay. right. I love it, I love it. All of the fabric control takes place right in front of the toe of the presser foot. And if you will notice, I'm just going to guide all of these fabric edges in as a straight edge of cloth right into the toe of the presser foot. Just a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. You stop and reposition your hands and your fabric frequently. Just because a serger will create stitches at Mach 1 doesn't mean that we have to run the serger at Mach 1. That's called fast. Right? Fast, that's right. <laughs> I love it. And, and look there how you have perfectly it. your straight line became a curved line. It's just perfect. Oh my goodness. Because we surged a straight edge of cloth. <laughs> the machine thought it was that way anyway, right. didn't it? It's a secret. Okay. Oh, and this, we have the uh, casing, the elastic casing. Margaret, I thought this was the greatest trick going. Oh my oh. goodness. And I love so this way of, of putting an elastic at the top of a skirt or pants, either one. So many of us make or wear elastic waist garments, so we will take the appropriate amount of elastic for our body and evenly distribute it to the waist opening of the garment. And then we'll just surge this elastic to the wrong side of the fashion fabric. Just stretching it out. Now, oh. I've researched this for you thoroughly. You be sure that elastic's caught in the needle before you start stretching it or that elastic will slip out from under the toe of the presser foot and pop you in the nose. Oh no! <laughs> oh, it will. So here we have the elastic casing. I mean, I'm sorry, the elastic is attached to the fabric, you see? But that's not really very pretty, is it? And we wouldn't wear it this way. 
So to create a casing for elastic, we're going to wrap the elastic in fabric. Then much like a blind hem, we're going to position, just turn the entire waistband down onto the front of the garment. This time when we serge, we're going to serge through the stitch that attached the elastic and the fold in the front of the garment. We'll do this, by the way, without the cutting blade engaged. And you're not having to stretch it this time. It's already gathered up. Well, actually, right? we do. You are stretching. Actually, okay. we do. Okay. We're stitching through the original line of stitching okay. that attached so the, okay. the elastic and the fold in the front of the garment. And that was it. Tell me that. That is it. your sweetest little casing. If you've ever stepped into an elastic waist garment and had to redistribute the gathers, you'll appreciate that these are permanently and perfectly distributed and the elastic's never going to twist in the casing. Oh, Margaret, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Oh, my And pleasure. now we have some sewing inspirations for you on the serger. Margaret, this is the cutest top. Tell me what you did. Oh, well, please notice the wave stitch on the armhole and the neck edge. Serger, of course. Serger. And Martha, this was put together entirely with a serger, and it is reversible. See, that is so Completely much fun. Completely reversible. This is called two-in-one. You bet. <laughs> now, I love that skirt that we talked about a few minutes ago. Now, where were those curved lines that you made straight or made it <laughs> think it was straight? We have curved an outside curved edge okay. for the top portion of the skirt and then the inside curves on the two ruffles at the bottom. And we still have that beautiful wave stitch. With the pink and the black, I just love that. Now let's talk about curves again because this is totally fascinating to me, this quilt. If you'll notice the heart shape or the mouse and the cat, these are little tiny drunkard's path quilt blocks that were put together with a serger. No pins and no clipping, remember. We just feed all the edges in as a straight edge. It's just well, it's just fascinating to me to see this kind so of work, quick. this mm -hmm. quilt done on a serger. I think we have a little bit more of a patchwork on a serger, don't we? We do. Now, this jacket features the waves that go up and down. And now, were these really done on a serger? Were the Peace. pockets on a serger? Okay. Pieced with a serger. And this jacket also is reversible with more pe patchwork, more piecing done on the serger. Yes. And these cute little sleeves, I don't think we have any. This is all made on the serger, though. Every inch of this That's was right. done on the serger. That's right. Marty, what about that darling little purse over there? This just kind of looks like me because I love these colors. What did you do here? <laughs> this is a good example of how you can use your embroidery machines and your software to create a different look from the same shape or the same design. This little purse just features a, a a selection or, or rather a variety of different ways that your embroidery machine can use the same design and give you a different look. And of course, if you just want to do applique, that would be good too because the stippling you can be done exactly. with just a regular sewing machine. Mm -hmm. Oh, now you know I love heirlooms, so. Oh, oh how pretty. This beautiful. Was every bit of it done on the surgery? Every bit. Okay. Every bit. We have edging lace attached with the rolled hem. The gathering was done on the serger. We have custom created piping and installed little pin tucks that look like twin needle pin tucks. We have serger shadow work, and this is just the cover stitch. There's it nothing looks exactly like hand shadow work. There's nothing under this fabric except thread. There's no extra tape or ribbon. And then we have one step puffing on the serger. And that other darling little pink pillow. Oh, now we call this rumba ruffles. The rumba ruffle <laughs> pillow. I love it. All done on the serger? All done on the serger. These we cute can, little ruffles. We have uh, little silk ruffles here that have the rolled edge from the serger. And we can gather and attach a ruffle to the body of the fabric all at one time. Oh, Margaret, thank you so you much. You are so welcome. And next we have some scrapbooking ideas for you. I love using the sewing machine and scrapbooking. And Margaret, I cannot wait to see that wonderful page that you're gonna share. Oh, let me tell you the story. It seems this young man received a bicycle on Christmas day. That's pretty exciting, but it was raining and it continued to rain. He had a new bicycle and it's still raining and he gets impatient. 
Well, then the rain ends and he knows nothing but great joy because he's out riding his new bicycle. Let me tell you a few things we use, a few techniques we use to put this scrapbook page together. First, we drew some placement lines on our paper so we would know where to position the copy of the photograph. And we use the conventional sewing machine and the blanket stitch to attach the copy of the photograph to the scrapbook page. Yes, you can sew on paper. To get the beautiful let letters for joy, we used some organza in the embroidery hoop, brought in those beautiful script fonts, and stitched out the three letters onto the organza. And then with great patience and very sharp scissors, we trimmed the organza away from the lettering and glued the letters in place onto the twill tape. And now I want to show you just how simple it is to actually stitch out the text of your choice onto twill tape. We have stabilized this twill tape with an easy tear away stabilizer, and we have selected the block font from the conventional sewing machine and we've stitched in the words Christmas and rain and I'll just show you just how easy this is. We'll simply guide the twill tape right down the center of the presser foot and you can add any text that you would like to with the sewing machine. So scrapbooking really is not um, just for the paper area anymore, we can actually take it into the sewing room. Oh, Margaret, so many people are really using their sewing machines, their embroidery machines, and simply just zigzagging pictures to the paper. It just gives it that extra sewing touch, and mm -hmm. it means we can combine two hobbies into one. That's right. Margaret, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's <laughs> my great joy. Thank you. And now we have some hand embroidery for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, Wendy Shane. Wendy is president of Wendy Shane Design. She is a regular designer for So Beautiful Magazine. She has studied embroidery in both Madeira, Portugal and at the Royal School of Needlework, and she has traveled the world over teaching embroidery and sewing. Wendy has designed and published 30 beautiful patterns, and she has authored four books. Wendy, welcome to the show. Well, oh, thank you, Martha, for having me. Today, I'd like for you to focus on this adorable little dress. This is one of my class projects and was also featured in one of our magazines. It has these little dots um, decorating the hemline, and these little dots are called granitos. Now, granitos are very easy to do, and this is a stitch that is famous on the island of Madeira, and I'm going to show you how to do it. As you notice, I'm not working with an embroidery hoop today. This stitch is worked over the finger. And now I'm going to take the needle in and I'm going to tie on by sewing into the center of the circle that I've drawn on the fabric and I'm sewing towards me. I'm going to take a small stitch and then I'm going to bring the tail down to the end, the end of the thread, and I'm not going to pull it through but just leave the little fuzzy end that you see here. And then I'm going to take a stitch back into the center between those two points. If this is point A and this is point B, I'm now sewing in at C, which is directly in between those two. And here what I'm doing is I'm going to just pinch the end of the thread slightly. And then I'm taking the needle out towards the end of the, the drawn circle. Now granitos are stitched with a series of stitches from points A and B. And now I'm going to have to change my point A holding the end of the thread back, A will now be at the end of the circle. So now I'm going to circle from, I'm going to stitch from A to B within the circle in the same points. The, the granito is going to be stitched approximately eight times. The first four stitches still stitched from points A to B are going to be stitched anywhere you want. In other words, just randomly stitched. And keep a little bit of tension on the stitch. I think that that's the biggest mistake we tend to make when we stitch these. Tension is very important. It should be slightly tight and steady. Now, the first four stitches, as I said, were 
pretty much my under stitches or my padding stitches. These four stitches now will be my exterior stitches. So they need to be placed strategically. The first one I stitch towards the left. The next one I go towards the right. I want to make sure that I round out the stitches. And so I'm going to lay these stitches in as I need them. And then the last two, this one and then one more, will be my top stitches that I want to be the prettiest of all. And that's pretty much it. Now to end off, I'm going to bring the needle down just to the right of the, the entry point. See, I'm going to have to move my finger so I don't <laughs> stab it. And then bring the tail or the end of the thread over. I'm going to turn it back and then just tie off by sewing through the threads there once or maybe twice. And that is it. And Her that is awesome. done. Very fancy So name. let me just cut the thread so I can show you what it looks like. There it is. Very it's fancy all there name is to it. for what looks very easy when you do it. Thank I wonder you, where the Mark. name Grenado came. Do you know? It means little grain. A little grain. That's How right. fascinating. Yeah. And when did this dress is so beautiful. Uh, so beautiful. Wouldn't you know we would say the dress <laughs> is so beautiful. The little granitos and the cut work and the very simple. It's all on handkerchief linen. That's correct. Now, could I ask you one more time? The, the needle and the thread that you use for the Usually granitos. only one thread, one strand of thread. Um, and if you want to make a larger granito, you increase your rotations. And needle? Needle, it depends on the thread. So I usually use either a 10 cruel or a 10 sharps, depending on which thread I'm using. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for sharing this wonderful little stitch with us. And now we have a really fabulous doll dress for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, Phyllis Hoffman. Phyllis is president of Hoffman Media. She's also the publisher of Southern Lady Magazine, Just Cross Stitch Magazine, and Southern Baby Magazine. Phyllis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. Well, we have a beautiful doll today, and she is dressed in the finest. I absolutely love the skirt, and I was intrigued by the shark's tooth border. Martha, turn the dress all the way around so that we can see every detail. It is just exquisite, and it is absolutely stunning to see the details in the skirt of this dress. Do, now, you, do you love the entredeau around the I waistline? Do. That's so, such a sweet it. touch, isn't it? It is, and I'll tell you, the first time I saw the shark's tooth, it scared me to death. Did it? I thought, my <laughs> goodness, you'd have to have a PhD in sewing to put those little tucks in there. But then when we really uh, broke it down into very basic steps, it's really quite easy. And that's what I love about it is it's step by step. It creates a very dramatic effect for sewing. Well, let's get started and let's learn the shark's tooth. It's simply folding and sewing, snipping and tucking. And that sounds very simple, but that's exactly what it is. The first step, and when you purchase your pattern, you will find that the template is given for you and you simply trace it onto your fabric. And you will have um, fold lines, which are solids, and your sewing is indicated by dotted lines. And that's all you do. You simply fold and sew. When you get to this step and you've made your tucks in the fabric, these are three steps that we will look at. The first row that you will, the bottom row here, is what your uh, fabric is actually going to look like once you have tucked, and then you cut it along the cut lines. And here is the easy part. This is where you fold. Now I like to, once I snip on the cutting lines, I like to go ahead and fold and finger press. That way I already have a fold line in place and just press it with your finger. And then you can open it back up as we have done here and you take our little magic sewing tool, a glue stick, <laughs> and you simply put the glue on the cut line. And then it just holds that little tuck right in place. And that's all there is to making the little teeth. And our second row shows what it looks like once you have all of the shark's teeth folded and tucked. And then we simply sew a zigzag stitch. And what I'm going to do is you just fold it to the back and Martha, this ought to be the easiest thing we do here is zigzag because everybody knows how to zigzag. And you just simply catch the edge of those little teeth in the zigzags. After you fold it out. After you fold it out, and yes. This can be done with any sewing machine. This is simply a zigzag. Any project. sewing machine at all. And I'm not gonna zigzag all the way across there, but I wanted to show you how that works. 
And then when you fold it out, it looks like the third row that we have here. And you can see how evenly that the uh, fabric will lay down. So when all of our sewing and tucking is done, we, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to starch and press. And you can see right here the little shark's teeth are perfect little triangles. The rest of this will be cut away after we miter our lace. Now mitering lace looks difficult and we go, oh my goodness, how could I possibly keep anything that precise? But it's a folding technique as well. Our lines to place our lace are indicated by the uh, dark blue lines that we see here. And we simply have your pins ready because that's very important in this technique because that will keep our lace in place for our pressing. And you simply lay your lace right along that line. Now here's the important part. What creates the preciseness is that we will take it and we will pin right at that point, keeping our pins as flat as we can. Come directly above and place another pin. And that's gonna hold it. Then you just fold it back on itself and give it a little tug. And then we'll simply pull that first pin and replace it going through both of the layers, creating a perfect corner. And then we simply fold the lace this way. And we continue all the way across. And each time we do it, holding that lace in place with a pin becomes the key to these corners. And that is what I love about this technique. It's folding. Then when we get to this point, Martha, we have all of our little points in place. We can see how they're zigzagged in place. Our lace has been mitered and we're gonna stitch it down. We simply stitch right here on the edge closest to the shark's teeth and then we cut away. Look at what we have now. Isn't this beautiful? A See, perfect, I love that. I think that's edge. the sweetest skirt in the whole world. Isn't it great? And then we, on the hem of our skirt, we place this down. We stitch along here on this edge, on the edge that is, of course, unstitched. And then we will cut away the back side. And as we look at our dress again, we can see where that panel has been uh, attached to the skirt of the dress and then our lace edging applied. And that cute little entredeau yes. and the little Swiss trim down below that finishes it's it perfect. off. Oh, see, it looks so hard and yet it's so it's easy simple. the way you explain it. And it's fun. Phyllis, thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. And now I have a wonderful vintage garment to share with you. I have a lot of beautiful vintage pieces, but sometimes a little dress just simply winks at me and says, take me home, take me home. That's what happened with this little dress. If you will just look at the delicate embroidery on the bodice, so sweet, little flowers, and I especially love the little buttonholes that the ribbon has been run through and it is tied into a sash in the back. The embroidery on the skirt of this dress simply speaks for itself. There really aren't words to describe the magnificent embroidery on this dress. My suspicion is that this was a pre-embroidered panel from Switzerland that was meant to be put into a dress. And they, they made a lot of these panels where you just simply made the dress. Now let me turn it around. The back is so sweet too. You can see that these little buttonholes continue around the back and more of the adorable embroidery is on the back. By the way, entredeau is used in between each one of the seams on this dress. And even the back has the sweet little embroidery. I absolutely love this dress and as I said, this is really one of my very favorite pieces. Mm -hmm.